Hello, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, FR Protection Knowledge You Need to Know, Fabric Information for Extreme Conditions in Multiple Applications, sponsored by Millikan & Company. My name is Kyle Morrison. I'm the Senior Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Thank you for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a few minutes, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. The views of the speaker and his organization are his own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Mention of any commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorse them. At the end of today's webcast, we'll have a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, then click the Submit Question button. You may feel free to ask your question at any point during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the Q&A session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, but due to the number of participants today, not all of the questions may be answered. However, all unanswered questions will be forwarded on to today's speaker who can answer them himself. For basic troubleshooting information, please click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete an evaluation survey. I'll talk a little bit more about this after the presentation. This webcast will be archived for three months, so you can access it after today's live presentation. To uh, return to the presentation just within about a day, simply return to the same URL to access the webcast. With that, I think we're ready to begin. Our speaker today is Travis Greer. Travis is the Development Manager with Millikan's Workwear and Productive Fabrics business, and he led the team that developed Millikan Amplitude FR Fabrics, a line of flame-resistant products at Millikan. Travis? Kyle, thank you very much, and good afternoon. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I'm very excited about a lot of um, events that are occurring in the flame-resistant market, um, a lot of innovation, a lot of improvement, and want to talk about that um, just a little bit today. On the slide, of course, just so you can put a face with the name, um, I'm pleased to be able to spend a few minutes talking to you today, and hopefully we can um, provide a little bit of knowledge to help you as um, EHS professionals and others as far as making good decisions regarding your uh, protective apparel. As far as what we will learn, um, we we have three factors, We're really going to focus mostly on the first two and then touch a little bit on point number three. But we really want to look at key factors, the standards, and then measurements that you can actually um, quantitatively uh, evaluate to help you make good decisions regarding your FR fabrics and garments for uh, protective apparel. And we're going to talk about um, a couple of the key market segments but really talk about the fact that um, this market is segmenting some into some specialization. Um, that's occurring because there is a lot of innovative products coming out um, in the U.S. and the international industry um, for both fabrics and garments that give greater protection, greater comfort, greater durability, and we're also going to talk about greater specialization. Some of the um, learnings, point number three there, uh, that can be brought over and adopted from particularly the structural firefighting market where FR has been a, a very technical um, segment for quite some time and there's a, a lot more emphasis on some details of the standard and, and some of those points I think are, are beginning to creep into the general industry segment um, that will make the products better going forward. Kind of as a, a review to bring everyone up to speed, um, I hope certainly our audience is, is fairly some um, has good education and background in, in flame resistance. But ultimately, when we talk about FR as it applies to garments and fabrics, we're really talking about flame resistance, the ability of the fabric and garments to self-extinguish. And in order to do that, um, obviously, we need to stop the combustion. And combustion is a chemical process that occurs um, at a fast enough rate to produce heat and often um, light visually is either a flame or a glow. This is um, actually from the F23 ASTM subcommittee. And if we look at the fire tetrahedron um, in the picture there, you can see that combustion occurs when you really have four components come together heat, 
a fuel source, oxygen so that the product can oxidize in a chain reaction. So when we develop flame-resistant fabric and flame-resistant clothing, we're looking to knock out one or more of those um, components of that tetrahedron and therefore stop combustion. Um, a lot of products are active by removing the fuel source, um, which often by forming a char, and that's why we talk about char length in one of the key tests. And so by forming a char, you remove the fuel and then stop the combustion. But there's other ways um, to stop that combustion, whether it be delay the heat release, reduce the heat release, stop the actual chain reaction itself, or even um, starve the fuel or starve oxygen from the, from the combustion process. So that's kind of a background, just a quick summary of what really FR is as it relates to fabric and garments. What we're really um, concerned with, though, as EHS professionals is being um, protecting our workers and also being in compliance with the law and with regulations and or common standards. Obviously, um, this category is regulated through the Code of Federal Regulations by OSHA in the United States. There are similar organizations um, in other countries around the world, um, but we're going to focus particularly on, on the U.S. and North America today. And OSHA in the Code of Federal, like, Federal Regulations states that you should protect your workers. In all cases, they did not tell you exactly how to do that, but um, they refer to consensus standards. And when it comes to flame resistance, uh, the most respected organization for consensus standards is the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association. And they write um, standards and sometimes even test methods. And then they also refer down to other test methods, particularly ASTM uh, test methods. And occasionally ASTM actually produces a standard. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit today on some some breaking news around the NFPA 2112 standard and an amendment to it that allows for cold weather insulation materials um, that's very applicable to our discussion around specialized solutions. Um, again, the two major FR segments, both in North America and really worldwide, uh, we typically refer to one as the oil gas petrochemical flash fire segment and that is generally governed by the NFPA 2112 standard, 2113 standard for garments. Then there's the general electrical utility segment, which is generally governed by uh, ASTM or NFPA 70E, which refers to the ASTM S1506 standard. <clears throat> Those two segments have um, some particular hazards in the flash fire. Um, it's a fire that spreads rapidly through a diffuse fuel. Uh, usually gas, it could be dust, um, and in that case, unprotected skin commonly receives second and third degree burns, and clothing can ignite and or melt depending on its composition and contribute to those burns. Um, but more specifically, if you're not wearing flame resistant clothing, ignition is a major uh, concern for severe injury. Uh, clothing that does not self-extinguish and ignites in one of these type situations um, exponentially raises the chance for severe injury or, or fatality. Uh, the electric arc flash market is a little bit different in that um, an electric arc flash is, is the breakdown of um, resistance in the air and then the electrical energy converts to heat energy and um, again creates a explosive arc with a pressure force, a sound wave, and a tremendous amount of uh, energy, plasma-based um, heat, light, and various uh, frequencies of, of light. Another concern, though, obviously on the electric arc side is that it can also ignite clothing, so it as well needs to be self-extinguishing. So when you look at the summary of these markets, again, um, you come down from the law, which is 29 CFR 1910, protect your workers, and then they refer to um, by inference and by specific directive from OSHA to the consensus standards. 
and then on down to the test methods. What I want to talk about today is how NFPA 2112 is changing via an amendment, but also how that particular standard is really becoming a gold standard, if you will, both in North America and um, internationally for FR durability, and therefore has applicability to a lot of different markets, not just oil and gas, and then how that relates to the other standards. If you look at the chart here, it talks about some of the specific uh, test methods that need to be passed, um, heat transfer performance, which is very important. But on the left, you see the ASTM D6413 test. This is what we refer to as the vertical burn test or um, char test. So a piece of fabric is burned um, both when it's new and after 100 industrial washes and then must pass um, a char length tear of less than four inches. This is really um, one of the most critical tests for testing flame resistance durability and it's one of the highest standards worldwide as part of NFPA 2112 and the way it's referenced. NFPA 2112 is the only standard that requires this, this type test to go to 100 industrial washes and also requires that char length to be four inches or less. It's a much more um, higher standard than what you would find in NFPA 70E, what you'd find in the Canadian standard, uh, European standards. Because of this, you see a lot of multinational companies um, requiring that workers that are in, in a, a range of FR, flame-resistant type protective needs, actually pass NFPA 2112. And so, as we look at NFPA 2112, um, we've talked about the two basic hazards, but let's talk about some additional workplace hazards that are really becoming uh, very important as it relates to FR. One is extreme environmental conditions. Um, a lot of oil and gas extraction and exploration occurs in some extreme environments, whether it be extreme um, hot weather in the Middle East, in the Gulf of the United States and Brazil, or extreme cold weather, as you might find in the North Sea, Russia, northern Canada, uh, southern regions of uh, South America. And so it's important for FR fabrics to not only have good flame resistant performance, but also to have protection for workers under extreme environmental conditions. In addition to the hot and cold, you see high wind environments, uh, extremely wet conditions. And then we may come into contact with some other um, hazards like radiant heat exposure, hot liquid and or steam exposure, and these are areas where there's a lot of research going on regarding FR clothing. For the purposes of this discussion today, we're going to focus mostly on the extreme um, environmental conditions, hot and cold. Some key considerations for your FR garments and FR fabrics in, in hot conditions, um, there's been a lot of products released in this area in the last few years. One is that your fabric is a certified component to NFPA 2112. And that was kind of the first, the first bar to pass, um, to have not only compliant fabric, but third-party certified fabric. Recently, um, OSHA, in the last two to three years, has put some emphasis on not only having certified fabric, but a complete certified garment, which means all the components, including the fabric, the findings, uh, which is the zippers and buttons, et cetera, are all certified, and then the garment itself is certified. And we only see the market moving more in that direction. So that's a key consideration as a EHS professional to make sure um, long-term that you're making plans to put your workforce into certified garments. When it comes to the comfort of those garments, we've really found that breathability, as measured by air permeability, and moisture transport are some very key factors in keeping your workers comfortable. Um, over a five-year time period, a study of the injuries in, in a major oil and gas segment was that about 18% of the injuries were from overexertion. Um, so this is a high number of, of workers that experience overexertion, and you want to be in garments that um, are helping minimize that influence. I personally have spoken to many EHS officers in some large oil and gas companies, and they simply said we have very few 
fire accidents, we have very few explosions, but every single day we have workers who are suffering from heat stress and missing significant uh, time on the job, significant productivity, and it's a risk to their health. And so they are very interested in finding fabrics and garments that can help uh, reduce that overexertion, reduce that heat stress. In a study of occupational environmental hygiene from 2006, in regards to protective clothing, uh, the study found that air permeability and moisture vapor transmission were the top two factors, uh, influencers in productivity and the risk of heat-related disorders. In fact, it said that uh, air permeability was the primary factor, and so these are things that we can measure in fabrics and ultimately also in garments uh, to really help design the ideal um, products. A more recent study from 2011 among um, end users and EHS professionals said that when it comes to fabric comfort, breathability is the number one factor. Lightweight, very important, and you can also see moisture control um, as a very key factor there as well. So if you look at the marketplace, um, moisture vapor transmission, moisture vapor transport, something that we can measure with a standard ASTM test. And what this test is really about is the amount of moisture that can pass through the fabric, giving you the effect of evaporative cooling and really keeping you more comfortable, cooler, and drier. A higher result on this test um, is a, a more comfortable fabric in a hot environment. Um, you can see here that there is a uh, performance apparel fabric, Under Armour Cold Gear. A lot of people are familiar with Under Armour. And Nike and other companies who produce fabrics for athletes to keep them dry and cool. And um, we predict, selected this particular one because it was in a comparable weight range to these other FR fabrics. You can see the performance level you get from that particular fabric, but you can also see that there are FR performance fabrics out there um, that do an excellent job. Um, I would like to point out a lightweight Millican product that's six ounce that you know has the highest moisture vapor transmission of, of anyone in this particular um, study, and it also is a NFPA 2112 certified fabric that is dual hazard for arc flash as well. We also talked about the air permeability. Air permeability is really about how much air can pass through a fabric to give you active cooling. Again, you can look at the uh, comparison of the similar fabrics there, a performance fabric and three common FR fabrics in the marketplace, and see that there is a wide range of performance, and there are uh, products in the marketplace, including the 6-ounce amplitude, that have a tremendous amount of air permeability, sometimes as much as 5 to 10 times more than other comparable protective fabrics. So you can see on the hot weather conditions, there are factors that you should ask about regarding your fabric and your garment that can ultimately lead to more comfort for your wearers. This is also true on the extreme cold uh, conditions side. Um, similarly to the, the hot weather products, you really need to have NFPA 2112 certified components by a third party. Um, these certification agencies are well-respected laboratories like a, a UL. Uh, there are other laboratories that do this as well. They not only verify that the fabric and the components pass the individual tests, but they also audit and monitor the manufacturers. And until recently, in this particular segment, cold weather, you could not get an NFPA 2112 certified garment. Uh, these garments have just not been available on the marketplace because there was not a good um, product technology nor a means to really test to the standard. But there's an update there and a new amendment to the standard we're going to talk about, which is going to make purchase of 2112 certified garments possible in early 2014, um, very soon. And so that's a big improvement to end users and to uh, EHS officers in this market segment. In regards to cold weather, we want to talk about a couple of more measurable values, uh, wind resistance and clothes value. They're very important in the comfort in those environments. First, just to kind of show you what we're talking about graphically, um, typically these cold weather garments are made up of an engineered layer solution. There's an outer shell, um, 
which again should be NFPA 2112 compliant. And that outer shell may or may not have uh, properties of wind resistance or water resistance depending on your um, particular need. Then there's typically a layer of thermal insulation or multiple layers of thermal insulation. In the past, again, not capable of meeting the NFPA 2112 standard. Then there's an FR inner face cloth, and these are designed for comfort up against the body. These are the type of products that we're discussing. There have been products on the marketplace of this design, yet they haven't been 2112 certified garments. Um, but the committee, uh, the NFA, NFPA committee has addressed this and produced an amendment um, that has become active on August 20th of this year that allows for the certification of these insulation and face cloth materials um, as a package to NFPA 2112 component certification. If you look at the uh, amendment clauses 7.1.2, states that the fabric, including cold weather insulation materials, shall be tested for flame resistance as specified in 8.3 and have a char length of not more than 100 millimeters. Again, this is the, the 4 inch vertical burn char length per the ASTM D6413 test we referenced earlier. But again, including passing that test in a new state, the fabric also has to pass that test after 100 washes. For that reason, NFPA 2112 is again the gold standard for specifying FR durability. Um, in a lot of FR applications, not just the oil and gas industry. In the second uh, requirement, you see that the cold weather insulation material must also uh, be constructed in flame resistant garments and be individually tested for heat resistance in its original form and it shall not melt, drip, or separate. So there needs to be uh, more than one flame resistant test that these materials have to meet even though they are underneath the outer shell and they are part of the overall garment. Of course, the passing of this amendment is a, it's a big advance. Um, it shows the ability of the uh, standards committee to adapt to new technologies coming into the marketplace and to bring new innovative solutions to the end users and to the safety managers to really uh, put well-designed products on their wares that can really protect them from a range of hazards, not only the flame resistant hazard itself, but the environmental conditions. And again, I want to point out that it is um, so important that, you know, this, this amendment was added to the NFPA 2112 standard uh, so that you can have a standard out there that really um, demonstrates that you have flame resistance durability in your product and you can feel good that even after um, 100 industrial laundries that you have excellent flame resistant properties. But then going on, again, there's, there's multiple hazards you face in these cold environment, oil and gas extraction and other FR uh, market segments. Obviously, wind is a major factor. Uh, wind can penetrate through a garment um, if it's not designed properly and make the wear extremely uncomfortable. Um, as you can see here, again, a, a low wind resistant FR fabric allows a tremendous amount of air to pass through. Wind resistance is really the inverse of air permeability we talked about earlier. And so air permeability isn't necessarily a good thing in all cases, certainly not in these type of environments, these cold weather, high wind environments. You can again see that there is a complete range of um, performance in the wind resistance testing. Um, a particular FR fleece that's designed to be wind resistant uh, might perform fairly well, but it still allows a tremendous amount of, of uh, wind to pass through, which can make the wear very uncomfortable. There are other solutions, including uh, Millikan's 9-ounce amplitude with epic finish that can uh, provide a excellent wind resistance, still allowing the garment to be moisture breathable, but uh, almost block the wind entirely from passing through the garment. CLO value is something that um, probably not a lot of people are familiar with, but CLO literally stands for clothing insulation, shortened and it's expressed in uh, Kelvin 
unit area per watt are the units. You can then normalize clove value by dividing by the weight of a particular fabric to give you the, really the clo efficiency of a particular fabric and ultimately a garment. Um, clo is something that's part of the uh, ASHRAE standard in regards to heating and air conditioning and, and the designing of uh, building comfort. But it is a very useful value when you're measuring the thermal insulation properties of fabrics. Again, you can see that this is a critical factor and there's a range of clo values out in the marketplace. Um, you can see that a standard insulated uh, coverall fabric used for workwear uh, performs to a certain level, but there are some innovative FR fabrics in the marketplace that perform even better, um, normalized by their weight. And then in this case, of course, the Millican product and the FR thermal fleece perform very well. So really what we're talking about is balancing the needs. Um, we've always talked about balancing the needs in the FR market between excellent FR performance, adding comfort, and adding durability, but we're really talking about designing for more specific environmental conditions. Um, and the potential for that now exists because of a lot of new technologies coming into the marketplace and because of the recognition of both the test committees with ASTM and the standards committees within FPA to adopt um, language into those standards and into those test methods that allows for these new technologies to be applied to the particular FR performance necessary. So ultimately, we don't design products now to just give maximum FR protection um, because when you optimize for one particular factor, you may sub-optimize for other factors, ultimately reducing the overall performance. Um, Overprotection can actually lead to loss of utility, loss of function, reduced movement and visibility. Um, it can lead to increased thermal load on the wear and increased fatigue. And that is something that uh, many manufacturers are working to, to no longer just optimize overall FR performance, but optimize the performance of the garment specific to the environment is uh, created for. You know, other than the, the oil and gas hazard and the arc flash hazard, there are other FR segments out there that are growing, and a lot of this technology also applies to. Uh, you see an uptick in the, in the fire service market, uh, wildland firefighting, station wear for uh, firefighters, even their total turnout gear. Um, there's a lot of new technology coming into these markets, there's a lot of things that can be applied to these markets from the durability standard in NFPA 2112 as well. You see markets that are kind of on the horizon, uh, both in mining, where there's a multitude of hazards that exist, uh, combustible dust that might be seen particularly in agriculture, and then the combined hazards that are seen in certain uh, locations. And then in the uh, molten metal segment, steel and aluminum industries, uh, there's a lot of application around NFPA 2112 along with the ASTM test method for um, molten metal splash. And so these, these comfort test uh, methods that we've talked about can apply to all those areas as well. To kind of summarize a lot of the things we've discussed today, as the need for extreme protection increases, the key thing to consider is the thermal load on the wear, the thermal load that the wear experiences as part of their actual uh, job application, whether it's extreme hot weather, extreme cold weather, um, wind, other hazards like hot liquid, very wet uh, conditions. And the consensus standards that are being recognized by OSHA NFPA standards in particular are being revised on a regular basis to accommodate for these new technologies. Of course, the new amendment to NFPA 2112 is a perfect example of this. These guidelines um, are actually increasing the number of products that are, that are available and being brought to the marketplace um, to give wonderful protection features to workers. Um, and actually help increase their productivity and reduce their fatigue, et cetera. Finally, um, as, as we move forward, FR products can include a lot of new technologies, 
which balance out some of these factors we talked about today. The heat transfer performance, it's so important to so many of the FR standards. Air permeability, that's so important in the hot weather environments. Moisture vapor transmission, again, so important to keeping a worker dry, cool. The clove value, a key measurement of thermal insulation. And then I mentioned here THL, um, should have spelled out that acronym, but total heat loss is a major measurement that you find in firefighting turnout gear, whether it be proximity or structural firefighting. And as we design um, particular garments for specialty applications like molten, mill and molten metal, steel, and aluminum, or even for um, steam protection, this total heat loss measurement, THL, I think is um, – definitely an area where we can have a lot of learnings from structural firefighting that will come over into the general industrial FR. And then ultimately, it's exciting that we can look forward to a number of cold weather products coming in 2014 that should be certified to the um, NFPA 2112 standard. So as a safety director, I think it's, um, it's very exciting um, for those in this industry to be looking at all these innovations and changes that are coming, and it's very important to understand what these factors are uh, that we've talked about today. These measurements that can be quantified and that can really impact your wares, the changes in technologies that are coming, the test methods, and um, although we like to try to simplify this thing down, truly FR is actually a fairly complex market. Uh, there's a lot of hazards that we're looking to protect against not just strictly flame resistant. And so it's important as a EHS officer to understand all these factors and to work with vendors that make um, garments that are certified and not only compliant to the most uh, up-to-date consensus standards, but are also certified. And then work with companies on the manufacturing side from a fabric standpoint and a finding standpoint and all the components that go into those garments. So it's good to have partners that are very knowledgeable, and it's excellent to be searching out education of the, um, the most up-to-date standards and test methods that are coming into the marketplace. Um, so ultimately, we at Millican are, are very excited about um, these advances, very excited about the new technologies, very excited about the new NFPA 21 TEL standard. And I uh, thank you for the time to talk about this at, uh, these changes this afternoon, and I hope that our uh, presentation has been informative to you, and we'll be entering now uh, into a period of uh, question and answer. Okay, great. Thank you for that presentation, Travis. Uh, before we get into the Q&A, I want to remind everybody of the short evaluation survey I mentioned at the top of the hour that we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen now. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we ask that you please consider completing it to let us know your thoughts. Your input uh, helps us as it improves future webcasts, so I hope you take the time to fill out the survey. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blockers. Okay, uh, let's get to some questions, Travis. Um, I want to clarify something here. You, you were mentioning a lot about some of the consensus standards and, and standards, and you mentioned NFPA requirements. What about OSHA? Has OSHA adopted, or do you, are you aware of any plans for OSHA to adopt the use of uh, ARC-rated clothing? I am not personally an, an OSHA expert, um, but I certainly try to track and follow what's going on in the marketplace and how OSHA is reacting. We do know that OSHA has uh, made some primary fines against um, certain businesses or industries when they have not adopted the ARC Flash standard and uh, complied with NFPA 70E. And of course, as it regards to garment and fabric, NFPA 70E does reference the ASTM F1506 standard. So um, again, in the actual law, the Code of Federal Regulations, um, ARC Flash protection has not been written in specifically. There is an update that's expected, maybe within a couple of years or less, the way that language may get a little more specific. But per the interpretation, I would say OSHA is currently enforcing uh, the consensus NFPA 70E standard um, 
in such a way is that I would consider it somewhat adopted. Okay, great. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about um, FR clothing needing to be, you know, breathable and so forth for uh, wear in hotter extre or extreme hot climates. Uh, we have a question here where this individual noticed that there was an increase in heat stress among workers who are required to wear FR clothing in the workplace, as opposed to those industries not required to wear FR. Um, is the FR industry looking at the added heat stress to the wearer? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's absolutely kind of what we're talking about today. Um, we do understand that prior to OSHA really enforcing, um, particularly the NFPA 2112 standard, that a lot of workers in, in some industries that really did need protection were not wearing FR protection. And again, in general, with older technology, their daily wear was more comfortable and gave them less of an issue with heat stress, you know, if they're wearing a common cotton t-shirt than if they're wearing a NFPA 2112 protective garment. So that's why the industry has been working and Millican and others have been working so hard at producing products that um, reduce that heat stress and make the FR product more like a performance sports apparel. And that kind of goes back to the charts we showed on our six ounce product that has such a higher permeability in such a high moisture uh, vapor transmission that it can cool you and, and help keep you cool just as if you were wearing performance sports apparel um, rather than what you traditionally think of as FR. So there are options out there today where the worker can be protected um, from both, uh, um, you know, flames and arc flashes and the dangers there as well as the dangers of heat stress. Absolutely. There's a lot of good products and innovation coming onto the market and are already there uh, to really help protect against that heat stress as well as give you the FR performance you need. Great. Uh, we, we've gotten some questions here, um, some specific questions regarding uh, the materials or rather the clothing themselves, the F F FR garment clothing. A um, couple questions here. Uh, are FR shirts required by the manufacturer to be tucked inside the FR pants? Um, again, I'm not um, – we are a fabric producer, Millican & Company, not a garment producer. So I mm -hmm. cannot speak to all um, FR garment manufacturers and their requirements. Um, but if a, if a garment is, is FR mm -hmm. and it is untucked, um, you know, you might have a safety concern around it being untucked from the standpoint of being able to catch on some equipment. Uh, there might be some other safety concerns there. But as long as no non-FR uh, garment is exposed, I don't necessarily see a flame resistance concern there. Okay. Might it be a good rule of thumb just to just to have it tucked just to be on the safe side then? I think from a, a safety manager's point of view, it's always a good rule of thumb to have your, your shirting materials tucked in just because there are other safety hazards, yes. Okay. Now, along those lines, um, is there a recommendation uh, for undergarments composition under the FR apparel? Uh, you, in one of the slides, you brought up kind of the, you know, the layers, and then there's that undergarment that is right next to the skin. Um, are there any recommendations for those for, for those clothing? Yes, and there's that's an excellent question. There's a lot of confusion in this area, and again, it's because this is somewhat of a complex market. Mm -hmm. um, neither standard actually requires an FR undergarment, but there was a change in the arc flash standard recently where an FR undergarment could be used as part of your arc rating, and that, that has been taken away. So you have to get your entire arc rating from an, from an FR garment. That being said, um, as being someone that's been involved in this industry for a while and, and knowing what a lot of other safety professionals and uh, colleagues think on this matter, we recommend it's best to wear FR undergarments. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. If you were, for instance, in an arc uh, incident on the electrical side, where your outer garment, um, the arc incident was actually higher than what your outer garment was rated for, your undergarment could ignite uh, if it's not FR, and that could cause a severe, severe injury. A similar situation could occur on the oil and gas um, flash fire side as well. So for that reason, we would recommend that you wear at least an FR, um, minimal FR protective undergarment when you're wearing undergarments. 
Okay, great. Uh, you mentioned some of the longevity of some of the clothing. C could you speak specifically to the longevity of FR winter bib coveralls and jackets? Um, it's a little difficult to talk about um, the longevity of you know just a particular product category because I don't know exactly what the fabric is made out of. Um, winter garments typically do not get um, washed quite as, or, or over garments, outer garments do not get washed quite as much. Um, so therefore, if, if the garment, the outer cloth has been certified to NFPA 2112, the component outer cloth, I would expect the FR longevity on that product to be extremely long, uh, just because that standard is to 100 industrial wash. So again, when you're talking about multi-layer winter wear garments, uh, at a minimum right now, you want to make sure that your outer shell component fabric has been certified to NFPA 2112. Okay, great. Um, we had another question uh, sort of related to cleaning. Um, can you discuss cleaning uh, if the fabric comes in contact with oil? Yes, that's a, that's a difficult one and another one that the, the market is working hard to address. Um, this is one of the reasons that a lot of um, end users use industrial laundries because industrial laundries do have a lot of experience at um, removing oil and using the proper cleaning guidelines per the FR manufacturers to make sure they uh, do not compromise the FR performance. Um, typically, it's a hotter formula with a lot more um, caustic in the wash formula, like a, a sodium hydroxide um, solution, and that's also added to a surfactant to help remove the oil. Um, there are some other methods to doing that, but the key here is to make sure that you look at your fabric producer's cleaning guidelines in the label. Um, and then again, secondary to that, uh, some companies who have these heavy soiling environments contract to an industrial laundry, um, the reputable ones who have a, a lot of experience in uh, removing heavy, heavy soiling in FR garments. Okay, great. Um, I want to go back to uh, the issue of heat exhaustion and overexertion. Um, again, you, you mentioned that there are more options out there nowadays, but what would you say is the best PPE solution for workers who might be in danger of heat exhaustion or overexertion? That's a softball question since I'm with, with Millican and Company and, and we make a, we make a great um, a solution here. I, again, we have a, a six ounce product um, that is an 8812 cotton nylon under our Amplitude brand that we believe is one of the best products on the marketplace for the hot, hot weather environment uh, because of its uh, extraordinary breathability, extraordinary uh, moisture control, and it's just one of the most comfortable uh, dual hazard NFPA 2112 certified and NFPA 70 HRC2 products out there. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly we do have competitors who have also released some um, some pretty good products in that category as well. Um, so I would certainly recommend taking a, a look at ours and love to you know, follow up and help facilitate that if possible. Um, but, but there are some good products on the marketplace that have come out in the last couple of years for these extreme hot weather environments. Okay, great. Um, I, I want to pose a situation to you. What if there is a, a worker who is in a potential flash fire environment, but they also perform a few electrical tasks? What's the best way to choose a PPE solution for, for this worker? Um, so in that category, and that's in the industry, sometimes we throw around this terminology dual hazard, which is, um, you know, some people, quote, in the know would understand what that means. Uh, but we kind of use it generically right or wrong to mean it's a 2112 certified product, and it's also a 70E HRC2 specifically product. Um, HRC2 has become the most common level of protection in the arc flash industry um, for those particular electrical tasks. So we would tell someone who um, was coming in contact with both, and and we hear a number, you know, in oil and gas that you know 25 to 30 percent of all workers might have both hazards at the same time. And we would recommend that they they get one of these dual hazard products, um, which is both 2112 certified and HRC2 arc flash rated. Again, um, 
Millican and Company produces a number of products like the six ounce I just described, and so do our our competitions. And there's a lot of good garment manufacturers out there who have very good dual hazard um, products for that type of application. Okay, great. Um, I'm not sure if this is something that you can speak to, but we had a question here. What type of cost increase do you see with what is coming up in 2014? I'm assuming that's that's talking about some of the various products that, that you might be having coming out. Um, well, again, when, when we're going to go to these outerwear certified garments, there is certainly a cost involved there mm -hmm. um, because there's a tremendous amount of testing for all those components. And um, and then there will be some upgrade to the technology to be able to hit that NFPA 2112 compliance. So I would anticipate um, those those certified outerwear garments to have a cost increase. I would hate to to quote that um, here, but I would I would certainly say that you know I'm just going to throw out a ballpark. You know maybe a 10% cost increase. I don't know exactly. I, I will certainly say there will be cost incurred um, for both the testing. And the um, and actually the technologies it takes to hit those um, levels of performance. Okay, great. We had a follow-up question to a question you answered earlier about kind of dual hazards. Um, when a product is considered a dual product, uh, will it list both standards it meets on the tag? Yes, absolutely. When a product is um, a garment is a dual hazard garment, the labeling should indicate that it is both. NFPA 2112 compliant and or certified, and it should also have the ARC rating as a you know NFPA 70E compliant and ARC rated to either HRC1, HRC2, or even some of the higher levels. Okay, great. Um, and we had another question here, uh, again, about um, kind of Millican products. Um, Millican products, do they provide the same protection as, uh, say, a 6-ounce uh, Nomax? Absolutely. Um, you know, six ounce Snowmax has been really a uh, a core product in the oil and gas industry for uh, many, many years. And it is a product that's able to be certified in SPA 2112. Uh, one of the deficiencies of it is it is only arc rated for HRC1, so it doesn't hit that higher level of electrical protection. But um, Millican and Company actually makes um, several uh, Nomex 3A based products, the six ounce you're referring to. We actually have a specialty uh, Nomex CXP product that is actually HRC2 and is dual hazard. And then we have a number, number of other products in our product line that are dual hazard uh, for both oil and gas and, and uh, ARC level 2 rating. Okay, great. Thank you, Travis. Um, seeing as we have no more questions, uh, that will conclude today's webcast. I want to thank everyone um, who asked uh, some of the questions that came in. Again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey that should, be pop, uh, should have popped up on your screen. Um, I'd like to thank Travis and Milliken and everyone who listened in. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you very much.